Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Thursday, June 1st, 2023. I can't believe it's June already. The June issue of Proceedings is on the street, so if you haven't already seen it, if it hasn't arrived in your uh, mailbox, you can find it online. Great to have you on board, everybody. Today we've got a great guest uh, joining us uh, from Singapore, but before I get to him, I just want to remind you that uh, the show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Since 1873, 150 years now, the members of the Naval Institute have been the foundation of everything we do, from proceedings to naval history to USNI news to professional books and events and conferences. If you enjoy the show, ring the bell, subscribe, recommend us to your friends, and become a member of the Naval Institute at usni.org forward slash join. Okay, uh, joining us today, as I said, from Singapore, where it is two o'clock in the morning, is Brent Sadler, Captain U.S. Navy retired. He is the author of the latest book out from the U.S. Naval Institute Press. It's titled U.S. Naval Power in the 21st Century, A New Strategy for Facing the Chinese and Russian Threat. Brent, great to have you on the show. Well, great to have me on on the, mid, on the Midwatch. On the Midwatch, indeed. What, what brings you to Singapore this week? Uh, so I'm here for the Shangri-La dialogue. So it's gonna there's gonna be some fireworks. The Chinese sent a senior general uh, to represent, and of course SecDef. So I'll be I'll be bringing my popcorn to watch the show and take lots of notes. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, you can write a proceedings article on that. <laughs> I'm sure there's quite a few that probably come out of this in the side meetings that are that are going on too. Uh, but well, it's a great I, event. Yeah, that sounds exciting. Other than the sleep deprivation experiment that it provides. So. Um, so before I launch into some questions, I just need to say, wow, congrats on the book, because it's well written, it's clear, it's incredibly comprehensive, and I recommend it to everyone. Uh, really, really impressive work. Uh, what spurred you to write it? Uh, so there's a long story that's in the preface that kind of gives a background, but what really agitated, I think, for me to get this book published uh, I mean, a lot of the research, and I've done a lot of, like any good staff officer, a lot of good work over the years, you know, getting the ideas out there. But when China started to crack down on Hong Kong and the, and the protests there in 2019, it was clear that the Chinese Communist Party had turned a corner and we weren't prepared for what was coming. Uh, and so I needed to get that out there. Uh, and I included a little bit of Russia in there because I've seen this, this story before. Uh, we get distracted, strategic distractions, kind of an American pastime, and yeah. we can't afford that again. So, Absolutely. Yeah, good point. Um, so on page 50 of the book, just jumping ahead mm -hmm. a little bit, you've got a, um, a, a concise explanation for why navies exist. And I'm yeah. always looking for these. And there's some been some good ones in our American Sea Power Project uh, articles. But uh, this one really jumped out at me. Could you read it? And then I'll ask you to explain why the U.S. Navy is insufficient to that purpose today. Um, just to make sure, like on page 50, uh, I was looking, but actually what I found, um, uh, one of the places earlier on in the book that I found that it was a good quote as well. Okay. Uh, and earlier on in the introduction. Um, so, let's kind of get to the right thing. To deny China and Russia victories without firing a shot, the Navy will need to build and employ a larger fleet with new competencies to keep comp competitors in Beijing and Moscow unsure of the correlation of forces. Attempts to, ch to counter Chinese and Russian campaigns have been mixed, with failures in the South, South China Sea, Ukraine, and Georgia pointing to an inability of today's military to preempt fait accompli operations. The United States cannot wish away this. And then they go on to talk about, in peacetime, it's competition, but that doesn't mean that the Navy is not focused on the ability to fight and win wars at the same time. All right, great point. And so um, what makes the U.S. Navy not up to that challenge today, in your, in your view? The, the simplest, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a simple engineer, and the simplest solution, of this, the root of all of the problems that we have today, we simply don't have enough ships. And that's the simplest answer. There's a lot more, and we can, there's a lot of rabbit holes to get into, but if you don't have the ships, you don't have the presence, and your adversaries are going to make it so that you have to react. The president's going to have political pressures to act, and that means that your fewer number of ships have to stand the watch 
which means you're on a much more frequent rotation. And that causes more wear, accelerates the time that you got to get back in the shipyard that also wears down the sailors. And so you have sailors voting with their feet, leaving manpower. So all of those problems all kind of emanate out of not having enough ships. Having a small, and, too, too small yeah, a navy. Yeah. yeah. You you bring up the point which a lot of people have made in, in the pages of proceedings and other books that I've seen. You know, at the end of the Cold War, we were almost at 600 ships in the U.S. Navy with mm-hmm. about 100 plus or minus constantly on deployment, right? And now we've got a Navy half the size, three little less than 300 ships. And we also have been trying to maintain 100 ships for deployed at any given time. So with a third, you know, half the size Navy maintaining as much for deployment, you, you know, you're, you're essentially putting way more miles and way more wear and tear on the car than you did, you know, 30 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Uh, and it's a different nature of operations at sea, too. We're not dealing with a Soviet singular threat. We're dealing with uh, North Korea, Iran, uh, global terrorist syndicates and illicit activities all over the world that we have to respond to. Those are the relics of the post-Cold War. But now we have major war coming back to Europe with uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, So the Navy's got to be postured in a way that it hasn't been in a long time and capable. And then you've got China, massively modernized and expanded that, that's going to be a blue water naval fight that the U.S. Navy hasn't had to contend with since the Soviets. So all these pressures, it's not, it's, it's a new Cold War. It's not the old Cold War that we're in right now. Yeah, it's like a, a multipolar Cold War. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so we had on the show Jim Fennell, retired Navy captain, former PAC fleet director of intelligence. You know Jim well. Uh, you know, we had him on last year. And then we had him on just uh, maybe a month ago or so talking about his most recent update in proceedings on the PLA Mm -hmm. Navy. So our listeners are well-versed and recently well-versed on the the Chinese Navy rapid, as you said, rapid buildup, modernization, et cetera. Um, But you bring out a point that we didn't get a chance to talk with Jim about. In your book, you also mentioned the China Coast Guard, which is now the world's largest Coast Guard. And you mentioned their maritime militia. Uh, just mm-hmm. describe for our listeners and, and viewers those problem sets as well mm-hmm. and, and how they're manifesting in uh, yeah. not just in the South China Sea, but are, are in the region and, and perhaps even farther abroad than that. So those three branches of the armed services and the Chinese didn't they resisted the CNO making that assertion back in 2015 when Admiral Richardson went to Beijing and, and basically said hey, we're going to treat. Maritime militia, like it's in the arm of the Chinese uh, PLA. Uh, it is, by all practical purposes. And they operate in concert with the Chinese Coast Guard, which looks very much like the U.S. Coast Guard, but the mission set's different. The ship sizes are different. Uh, and then you've got, of course, the PLA and the Navy. But that maritime militia is probably the most unique. And it's a very Maoist, people's uh, front kind of effort. And it's repurposed fishing vessels with folks on board that have some limited training and have some equipment like uh, secure communications, uh, weapons, and they're usually, they're the vanguard of the PLA. And they go out, they harass other fishermen. They also are used to harass other navies uh, of the region and on on occasion the U.S. Navy. Uh, And that Navy, we're gonna see that probably also start to increase. But they operate in what's called an echelon or a cabbage strategy, where the maritime militia is up front causing, the, you know, getting into the scrum and the fray. And then the Chinese Coast Guard is nearby to kind of provide an air of legality or policing presence. They're always going to side on the, on the part of the maritime militia, but they're there to provide that kind of uh, cover and a little bit more firepower. And then if the, if the enemy country brings out a bigger ship, maybe vessel. Then the PLA and is just over the horizon, also watching, and will move in as necessary. Uh, this kind of game plan has been played out for about 20, 20 plus years. It's starting to come to the end of its utility for the Chinese as other countries start to come together and work collectively. And the United States starts to put more of assets and sustains them in East Asia. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. It, 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 I think of it as so, sort of... A, an escalation ladder, right? There's the ability for the Chinese to play in that hybrid gray zone, 
some some would call it maritime insurgency, where they use that the maritime militia, their fishing fleet, to exert influence. And then if if that fleet uh, reaches a, a level of pushback, the Coast Guard is right there. And if that fleet doesn't have enough firepower to get it done, then the PLA Navy is just over the horizon. Right. So yeah. uh, it's it's an effective strategy. It's been effective for them. But yes. as you point out, you know, perhaps coming towards the end as as everyone sort of is now onto that playbook, right? We all realize right. hey, this is what they're doing. This is how they're using these three different fleets in a coordinated fashion. And this is what it's going to take to push back against that. It's going to take a coordinated, persistent presence. Those ideas have been, and you wrote for it last year, the Maritime Counterinsurgency Project that have been in the, the pages of proceedings. A lot of those ideas uh, are, are in your book. And I thought, you know, okay, yeah. I've seen this again. This is terrific <laughs> stuff. Um, I'm going to go back. I, I apologize. I said yes. page 50. I found it. It's on page 73. I don't know. That's a brain, oh, okay. brain glitch of my okay. part. The, the, oh, quote, no, no. the quote is this one, and I, and I love it. Navies exist to assure access to markets and influence events on land for political ends. Very short, concise quote. Navies exist to assure access to markets and influence events on land for political ends. And, and I think uh, it, it was certainly true for, for me in my Navy career. I didn't pay a whole lot of attention of the idea that the Navy exists for, for secure access to markets. You know, it was almost mm. a given that commerce, you know, just traded around the world freely. Um, the, you know, yeah, we knew that we, ex the United States Navy um, existed in some measure to, uh, to provide security of, you know, slocks, the, the sea lanes of communication. Um, but, but I think that's a, just a, it's a terrific quote and I'm, I'm putting it on a bumper sticker and I'm always adding things to like, why does the Navy exist? Well, here you go. Boom. It's, uh, it's actually pretty simple, right? Um, yes. And, and you, you bring out some of the economic arguments in your book too yeah. about um, just how much commerce there is at sea and the percentage of the of the global trade that moves at sea and if if that's not mm -hmm. secure if we don't have um, a free and open system and if countries revisionist countries like the Chinese or the Russians or the Iranians as we've seen you know Iran is now you know they're playing games in the Strait of Hormuz um, then that means that prices go up things can't move uh, you know stability and markets and all those things are are, are uh, under threat. Uh, just yes. your, your thoughts on that. No, I, this is one of the core uh, tenets of the whole book. And it was an observation actually goes back to my childhood growing up uh, in Asia uh, on naval bases, because uh, you could witness the, the legacy of these naval bases and the communities that grew up around it. There was an economic uh, pact or deal. It was unwritten, it was unsaid, but it was very much a deal. Uh, and there was there was great power and influence in that, especially in Japan, where communities basically viewed themselves as can inter interconnected with the base. And we just were not realizing it. Um, some folks call that base politics, but that takes a, too much of the negative piece. Uh, the economics, I think, are huge. And the Chinese are competing with us in a way that operates inside the scenes between Department of Defense, Department of State, Commerce or Trade, U.S. Trade Representative and and we just we need to readjust. And this naval statecraft kind of approach gets at that by embracing the economic elements of naval presence and could be used in places. I talk a little bit about Equatorial Guinea, where China tried to get a base uh, access, much like it actually successfully did in Solomon Islands, uh, which is still playing out. And it actually it speaks in a way to the host country in a way that Chinese can't. And it also leverages our, adva our advantages. Uh, in ways as a democratic open society and our Navy uh, in a way that the Chinese just will not be able to compete with. And so, you know, get inside their their baffles and operate outside of their capabilities. Uh, this Cold War is not our father's Cold War. It's a very different one. And we need to start kind of changing our framework and how we actually approach it. So uh, you just dropped it into the conversation there a second ago, but the term oh. naval statecraft, naval statecraft, mm -hmm. I, I, I love that. It's in the book a number of times. You define yes. it, you describe the different activities. So just briefly, because uh, you've got probably 50 pages in the book uh, uh, <laughs> dedicated to it. But, you know, if you had to talk to somebody 
who wasn't uh, never served in the Navy, perhaps you know lives in the in the Midwest, average American citizen who hasn't thought about the Navy or doesn't have to think about the Navy on a regular basis. How would you describe naval statecraft? Uh, so I've I've done this a couple of different ways. One way is I actually cited examples. The book talks about Djibouti. I mentioned Equatorial Guinea, the Philippines. Lots of case studies, and with our ECA, the agreement where we're getting new access. But the simplest definition of it, and it's not as satisfying as when you get to the examples, and that is naval statecraft, or probably better called maritime statecraft, is the synthesis of forward naval presence to trigger and then sustain economic development and mutual trade backed by and supported by proactive diplomacy. So even simpler, it's the merging of naval presence with economic economic statecraft and proactive diplomacy. Not just diplomacy, proactive, aggressive diplomacy. Got it. So there's that, I mean, that really calls for a synthesis, DOD, Department of the Navy, forward diplomacy, you know, forward deployments, there's, yes. a, you know, the, the economic arm, there's the diplomatic, you know, you're, you're talking embassies and ambassadors and diplomacies, you know, sex state level kinds of things. It's, it's multiple different levers yes. of national power pulled, you know, in unison um, with, with the Navy being sort of a, a centerpiece of it. Oh, yeah. One of the easiest and most frustrating things early on uh, arguing in, when I was still in uniform for what became the Build Act. And if not, if you're not familiar with what that what what it is, it was a repurposing of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. It was it was a U.S. government uh, assistance for investments for to enable American businesses to more securely invest in challenging environments for strategic purposes. The Build Act made it bigger, made it more focused, and it was intended to be in competition with the Chinese. Uh, it hasn't met that objective. But for the Navy to actually play in this, it's very simple. Simply embed a couple of folks that understand logistics of our operational plans over into what is now the Development Finance Corporation so that when they see a proposal for dredging to build out a pier, uh, they go, that location has value for us. Can we add a little bit? make the deal a little better for them. If they only would extend their proposal by 50 feet and dredge an extra foot deeper, we'd actually be very favorable for that. And Navy doesn't have a voice. Uh, it needs to have yeah. a voice. Because then, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then, then we could get uh, a DDG in there. We could get an LPD yes, yeah. in there. We could get a carrier, perhaps. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, no, that's a that's a, a, an interesting, important point. I, I, would, I'm, I was reminded... Uh, I mean, I, I spent one of my tours in the Navy, one of the most interesting tours. I was a naval attache in Moscow at a much uh -huh. better time than today. Um, and it was a time, it was very satisfying for me because uh, we had a lot of U.S. Navy ship visits to Russia, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's Vladivostok, Petropavlovsk, uh, Murmansk, yes. St. Petersburg, et cetera. And, you know, you can say whatever you want about, you know, you know Washington to Moscow level interaction, but... Navy to Navy and and sailor to sailor and you know American citizen to to Russian citizen that was very satisfying at the tactical end where you put a U.S. warship yeah. in town um, they participate in events they meet people they spend money as you point out in your book they buy you know yeah. buy things they they go to restaurants they um, they you know intermix it is a great diplomatic tool it's a very powerful diplomatic tool so yes yeah. uh, on the Russian front and. 2012, Putin had put like several billion dollars into refurbishing Vladivostok to host APEC. And having yeah. a U.S. Presence, military presence, uh, it, it, it matters what you do with it and how and how you exercise it to send a signal. But on the economic front, uh, when I was a defense, the senior defense official in Malaysia, um, tried several times to get a nuclear aircraft carrier to be the first time in, in many years. And going back to the Fat Leonard standards, everything got frozen out. Right. But there's been silting and everything. And I basically made the economic deal. I said, I got 5,000 sailors coming into town for five days. And just their, their discretionary spending, it's going to be about this much. Uh, the services that you're going to contract, it's going to be this much. How much does it cost you to dredge you know, to make the dredging so that I can get, you know, what would it be about 2 million U.S. dollars into your port, Port Plain, for five days? How much would it cost me? And it was... Not even, uh, it was like half a million dollars. 
Ah, wow. So they, they were going to make like a massive income by doing this on their own. And they actually went ahead and dredged because they lost the second aircraft carrier because there was a shallow spot naval reactors didn't like. Uh, so if they see that enticement, they see the Navy as an economic input, um, that also changes the way we think about contracting, too, which is another yeah. problem to really realize this naval statecraft. But it's there, and our partners in the world would rather us use it as part of a bigger strategy in statecraft, because we are much we offer a much better deal than the Chinese. We just don't play. We don't play it. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Uh, so switching back to the threat a bit, uh, and, you, and your book covers the, the China threat, China-Taiwan situation, what's going on mm-hmm. in the South China Sea, very comprehensively. Um, and, and much has been said and written for, the, for several years now about the decade of maximum danger, the Admiral mm-hmm. Davidson window, all referring to uh, this decade being the time when uh, it's, it's a very dangerous situation where China could decide and might have the capabilities uh, to resolve the Taiwan problem by force, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you were able to describe the danger and then give advice to the White House and Congress mm. and perhaps the next CNO, what would, what would you say that needs to be done about it now? Yeah, I'll start with what needs to be done. And I have to give credit to Admiral Aquilino because during the rebalance Asia Pacific 10 years ago, we tried to get an aircraft carrier out of CINCOM so that we could bolster and maintain one carrier strike group in the Western Pacific to signal that the United States was going to be there. He's maintained two carrier strike groups almost consistently for the last year and a half in the Western Pacific. It, not a lot of fanfare. I, I certainly, whenever I get the chance, I always call attention to it because that's significant. So that's yeah. the first thing. Sustain that, but then start to integrate more, you know, more forceful operations and planning with allies and partners in the region to the Chinese, who I would anticipate in the near, very near term, may try to test our resolve in a very limited kinetic way, bumping a ship, maybe having an untoward incident with one of our aircraft that may or may not result in loss of life. And I'm not sure we're ready for how we control what the Chinese have in their playbook, and that is very controlled escalation to learn how we operate and to test our resolve. So that, those are the like immediate must do now. Um, and then kind of getting into the longer term, we do definitely, I think, need to restructure centered around numbered fleets that make sense. Uh, I'm a big proponent uh, for, for reestablishing first fleet and basically focused on the, Oz, the 10 ASEAN countries uh, in that part and allow seven fleet to be more, more focused on the major war planning and operations in Northeast Asia, so from Taiwan, North Korea, and Russia to the north, but allow this first fleet to be focused in on building the access, the presence, and doing that counterinsurgency at sea, as Hunter Styrus talks about, in the South China Sea. That's a full-time job, and we're not giving it to them. So those are some of the things that need to be done. Um, there's, a, there's another list that gets into shipbuilding and shipyard capacity that I think are also urgently needed, right? Um, if it comes to China and the threat, those are the urgent things. Yeah, uh, just to pick up on the first fleet thread for a minute, I yeah, know yeah. that uh, former Secretary of the Navy, Kenneth Braithwaite, um, he floated that idea uh, pretty seriously, but it was very, you know, towards the very end of the of the Trump administration in his time as, uh, as SecNav. Uh, but I, I, you're the first person I've seen pick it up, and it is in your book, and it's you, you do describe it as that, you know, focus on ASEAN, uh, where would where would the, the logical place for it to be headquartered? Would it be Singapore? Would it be uh, mm. the Philippines? Where, where would you put First Fleet? So probably Singapore. Um, I think it has to be uh, an afloat command. I'm a big proponent. Of, uh, I was a flag lieutenant on the Blue Ridge back in 99 to 2001. So I'm a big proponent. I know what a command ship brings. Yep. But by having that command afloat with a three-star admiral, and I know we have enough, to make that happen. Uh, so I don't buy into the argument that we, are, we have too many flag officers. We we can't have a new one put into First Fleet. We can. Uh, and it would send the right signal. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have 50 new ships materialize or take 50 ships so you match seven fleet numbers. It right. starts and grows. And you already have a destroyer squadron, LCSs. You have logistics ships that are there. So the idea is that it would be a numbered fleet, but it wouldn't be exactly a carbon copy of 7th Fleet or 5th Fleet. 
yeah. but it would be in a float in a float base. There's already a footprint here at Comlog Westpac and in Sembawong here in Singapore. So there's a there's a base presence here already, but uh, I wouldn't be wedded to Singapore only. Uh, you may be able to move if it's on a float in a float command ship. You move, and if the crews are rotational and deployable, you could move from Singapore for like one year, one extended deployment there. You could move over to Sepangar, Malaysia. Uh, another year, if that was made sense, or even in Da Nang in Vietnam. So it allows you a flexibility to move around as the region opportunities and risk dictate. Yeah, uh, interesting, interesting concept. I like that. Um, so there's a, a chapter of your book that's called "A New Model Navy." Uh, I would say an, an alternate title uh, for our listeners could be "The Navy of the Future." And for those who are interested in technology, this is the chapter to read first. Um, mm. and, and, you know, one of the challenges for the Department of the Navy is not only building a big enough Navy, Navy, but also constantly modernizing it, bringing in new weapons and technologies. So, yeah. uh, Brent, what do you think the Navy of 2045 will look like in terms of uh, new technology? What are the key technologies you yeah. think that have to be researched, developed, tested, evaluated mm -hmm. and fielded? So on the, the manned and unmanned teaming. So that, that's a concept that goes back to when I was working on the the so-called breakfast club with Bob Work looking at the third offset. Uh, I'm, I'm, my background's in robotics and artificial intelligence when I was a midshipman at the academy, and I love that stuff. I think that's going to be a part of our reality. It already is now with artificial intelligence. So that's going to clearly be a part and a real part of the fleet. It's already here today, but it'll yep. become even more so, and it'll be just seamless by 2045. What's less clear... What I see as a part of this future is also bioengineered subsystems or even platforms that perform services or do functions uh, for naval assets. So this, this isn't something like out of a science fiction world. DARPA has already created multi-cell simple machines already. They, can just, they basically move around and move material and coalesce it into a grouping. And oh, by the way, not by their design, those cellular machines actually can self-heal. So that was this remarkable thing. It was a DARPA uh, news story of like the last the last year or two. So that's I'll probably... Look at, I'll have to look at that. So, so give an example yeah. of how a bioengineered yeah. machine, organism, something would, would have a naval use. What's an what's a example? Well, uh, one, one could possibly be that you have these living inside, say, a primary coolant loop of a nuclear reactor that could be going around and could be basically taking radioactive uh, particulate matter, condensing it, cleaning the, keeping basically the systems cool, uh, or not cool, but rather clean. Uh, it could also be, you could have for uh, sensors around the hull, like a skin that covers over the, the hull of the submarine, that would be able to detect if a swimmer or someone placed the device on it. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to necessarily do security swims, I'm a Navy diver too. You wouldn't have to necessarily do security swims, but you could also have self-healing. So if you kind of look at, there's a possibility if you had battle damage, these these kind of organisms might be able to, to heal some of this damage. Uh, it wouldn't be a complete replacement, but it would be something that could get you back home. Uh, the other is, would be kind of another area that I also see a lot of hope in is nanotechnology. And this also has a lot of potential for self-healing metals. Uh, it's not like something out of Terminator, but it gets kind of close to that by 2045. Wow. But you, you had, you, we had a previous conversation, and it, one, of the, one of the enabling technologies, quantum computing. That's, the, that's one of the key enabling technologies for controlling a bioengineered system, unless you just genetically engineer it to perform a simple function and it, go, does, it goes off and does it with no human control. And nanotechnology, nanorobots, nanoparticles, that would require, I think, you're getting into massive parallel processing uh, capabilities. And that is unlocked by quantum computing. And it will probably be something that we won't necessarily design a, a first quantum computer to do. And we may just by happenstance realize a more fuller potential uh, you know, in the near future. It's probably going to come by surprise, not necessarily by design. Well, lots to think about and uh, for our, our sci-fi fans to wrap their brains around that. Yeah, I, I was I was thinking as you were talking about, you know, the self-healing characteristics. Yeah. I visited the USS John Marshall uh, SSN uh, uh, you know, Virginia class submarine when it came to Annapolis last fall. 
after it had done an extended uh, Northern Atlantic deployment. And a lot of the acoustic coating on the, mm. on the submarine was kind of eaten up, right? It was, uh, it, 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 it had a hard couple of months at sea. Um, and wouldn't that be cool if that stuff was self-healing? Yes, just cellular, lived off the, the plankton and the photosynthesis when you were shallow, uh, and then it just grew back. And you certainly wouldn't have to glue it onto the, the hole of the submarine. You wouldn't have to worry about cutting it off and repainting it. Um, right. Might right. be a little slippery. Might, 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 there might be some interesting new changes of life, but uh, there's an interaction between technology and ship designs, and we haven't got the technology of robotics uh, and certainly not bioengineered systems, haven't gotten to a point now where the technology is feeding back in and where ship designs start from the blueprints to embrace these new te technology. We're in kind of a, a transitionary period in, in naval design, I think. Yeah, agreed. Uh, moving on, just to, to keep moving, because we're, we're running a little bit oh, short yeah. on time, but chapter seven of yeah, your yeah. book is uh, what a lot of people will, will glom onto. Uh, yes. And it's it's titled Fleet Design 2035. It's a comprehensive shipbuilding plan that would get the Navy to 575 ships by mm -hmm. 2035. You know, and and everybody, all of our readers and listeners know that the Navy has there's been a, a target of 350 ships and for quite some time now, two presidents, etc. It's actually written yeah. into law that there's going to be a buildup and it hasn't happened. So um, talk a little bit about your plan, because there's some interesting different types of ships, including a different type of aircraft carrier that we currently don't have. But also, is, yeah. is it realistic? Could we get to 575 ships in the next 12 years? And, and what would mm -hmm. we have to do differently than we're doing now? Yes. Yeah, so so the, the 2035 and also the timeline in that, the type of ships were biased earlier to this decade because it was we got to get through this decade with the Chinese. Uh, and we need to be able to match them and to pace uh, all the other threats at the same time. So that number is based, there's a mathematical equation in the book that takes in weather, where you need to be. So it, it is all mathematically based. Uh, likewise, the, react, the executability of that is also, also mathematically based. And it's not taking as a for granted that the shipbuilding capacity of today is all we're going to have. So in order to grow the shipbuilding capacity in the nation from today to where it needs to be to reach these numbers and added to, in order to make 2035, it's even more urgent than when the calculations were made two years ago. Uh, you have to send most clearly a predictable signal to the shipbuilders that that's sector, that there's money to be had if you can build the ships and these are the ships that we need. So you have to put the order out and then you'll start to get builders that will step up, make the capital investments if they've got that money on hand and assurance that the money is going to come. It means Congress has to change the way that it does business. It means American politics has to change. And I got so frustrated after writing the book and the discussions and what I was seeing, I wrote after the book another an idea that says, all right, you're going to have to break this shipbuilding out of the national the defense budget and create a new naval act, stable ship designs. So 45 of the manned big ships are stable designs. We've, in the last several long-range long, long range shipbuilding plans, we have said it's 45 ships, stable designs, write the check, get the orders in, industry will grow to produce them, they'll hire the workforce. Um, it's really not appropriate for Congress to start micromanaging by providing money so that a specific company can go out and train and, buy, and basically bring in more workforce, or to buy the infrastructure for that commercial shipbuilder to basically put trains in place. Better to provide them the demand signal and let them use best business practices to give the Navy the product they need on time. And that's a lot easier for Congress, quite frankly, to provide oversight. Yeah, and you give the example of the, the recent two-year buy for aircraft carriers. So the, mm. the Ford-class carrier, instead of buying one at a time, uh, there was a there was a two ship buy, and that saves yes. a, a billion dollars or so by buying two it, at once and sending that consistent signal to to HII in this case. Um, but but a, a block buy, a multi year yeah. block buy of of particularly a ship that's you know we've we've already got you know okay so DDG Flight Three, the Virginia mm -hmm. payload Virginia you know payload class right the Virginia Block Threes. These we know we want them. We know we know yes. a lot of them. We want them quickly. So hey, here's a here's a block buy, right? It just builds yes. these and don't don't make major changes 
which are expensive and you get change orders and you get new technology and all those things. Yeah. You're, you're, uh, our, our listeners have, have heard us talk a little bit about the Ford class, the revolutionary mm-hmm. you know, demand signal yeah. that, that, um, that, that the Secretary of Defense, uh, you know, Rumsfeld put on the Navy at the time, which in hindsight was extremely expensive. And you, you explain that well in here. So I won't, I won't go into it again, mm-hmm. but it's, it is a good example, I think, of the kinds of things that you're talking about. You got to make yes. this, this shipbuilding enterprise more efficient, and as you as you point out, you got to put out a a, uh, a stronger demand signal, a longer term demand signal. Somebody also recently was talking about, um, uh, you know, just what uh, continuing resolutions do to oh to yes, CAD. I mean that that is just it's it's taking a self inflicted wound every single year to our ability to buy what we mm-hmm. need to buy. You know, it makes it more expensive. Yeah. It gives you less time to do it. it. It interrupts that demand signal that industry wants. It's it's incredibly disruptive. So yeah, and I think we're going through a similar problem with the current budget negotiation that we that just wrapped up. We still go has to go to the Senate. So I, I right. we're doing it to ourselves again. And I think it argues for pulling shipbuilding out because it's unique and different from everything else in procurement that DoD does by scale and time. It's also the most important for competing against China. Yeah. But but there's a lot more in the book. Too. You brought up the, the, the new class of, of uh, aircraft carrier that yeah. would operate in a north-south latitude. It'd be a screen more for screening, but it would stay inside the first island chain more than the Ford class is constructed now with more sortie rates or sortie rates at a lower rate, but longer range aircraft. So there's, a, there's actually several other classes of ships in there. There's a nurse ship, there's a factory ship. Uh, these are things that need to come online and new ways of organizing our fleets. No longer just centered on, you know, uh, carrier strike groups and amphibious readiness groups or expeditionary strike groups. New formations are also popular. Yeah, including, it, you, I, I was impressed, this is back to my point about your book being comprehensive. You even address the combat logistics force. You talk about, mm. you know, the the oilers and the ammunition ships and, the, you know, how you're going to get the beans, bullets, uh, to the sailors and Marines in a contested environment. And there's, there's aspects of that in there as well. So it, it, it well oh, yes. done. Um, uh, last question, cause we are just about out of time. Your, your concluding yeah. chapter describes a theory of victory and calls yeah. for modern Trafalgar, Traf, yeah, Trafalgar memorandum. And you have yes. four wave, four waypoints. So describe what victory mm-hmm. looks like and what are those wave points? Yeah. So, so the waypoints go back to my experiences with, you know, conceptual, because I was involved in the conceptualization and then the actual actualization, the execution of the rebalance of the Asia Pacific, the defense strategic guidance, going back to 2010 through 2015. And so what's important is that you've got a very simple, elegant plan that allows people to know who's on, who's responsible for what and what the common vision is going to be and how the major elements of that agencies or departments or fleets play into that. That's the Trafalgar statement. It doesn't need to be long, but it needs to be very clear and concise. Um, I know what it would, if I had to write it, I know how I would write it. Yeah. Um, but the book doesn't, I don't have that in there, not, not, not enough pages. That's but your next other way, that'd be the next one. Yeah. But the, the waypoints are, what do you need to do to get those early successes? Because no one's going to know what you're thinking about. They're not going to want to take the time to understand and to get on board unless they see success and money behind it. Money's easier to get if you've got a good policy in the politics, but you also have to have something that works. And so getting early successes by the Secretary of the Navy, probably in this kind of strategic approach, is really, really critical. And it's a lesson from John Lehman's time in the 80s when he did Exercise Ocean Venture within six months of Reagan coming into office. Now the planning predated that, um, but that exercise demonstrated uh, a lot and it showed and it got the Soviets attention. So you have to have a success or else anything that you try to do will basically suffer from uh, analysis, paralysis, strategic admiration and not action. No, I, I like it. Good, good points. Um, so we are, uh, we are just about out of time. I want to give you an option for uh, saved rounds, uh, parting shots, anything before we sign off. <laughs> Yeah, um, so what, what's in the back of my mind, and I talked with uh, Jeffrey Till, who's up at Naval War College, 
uh, a week or so ago when I was up there for a conference. And that is, why is it the United States always seems to have this problem? It'll build a big Navy, fight a war, if it's the Civil War or if it's World War I or World War II or the Cold War, and then rapidly it atrophies. And in concert with that is the, is the merchant marine. And, it, and it, one of the key things that you find, at least I found in the last years of deep study, is you can't have a big navy without a bigger merchant marine and shipping sector. And we always get this kind of backwards. Um, navies are expensive. Merchant, fl merchant fleets uh, do take some control. They are capital and expensive assets, but they're strategic. And I think somewhere America, as Americans, we need to think about our shipping sector as more of a strategic asset of the nation and not purely as a business proposition. It's much more, it has much more consequence. That's my, my, my final part of that. No, it, uh, that's an important point as well. And it, it is, you, you, you talk about that in the book a bit and, and I'll harken back again to uh, our, my discussion with Jim Fennell a couple weeks ago. One of the points that Jim points out is that, you know, the Chinese uh, shipbuilding industry which doesn't just build naval ships, but it builds ships for the merchant fleet, a uh, global merchant fleet, not just Chinese flag, but other nations as well, because they have this massive shipbuilding capacity for the civilian shipping. They, mm -hmm. There's, there's um, economies of scale for ship for building navies, right? If, you, if you've got a big shipbuilding capacity, you can build both. You can build a big navy and you can build a big merchant fleet. And the Chinese have... Uh, they know that they've taken advantage of it and, and they've got massive shipbuilding capacity, which has benefited their yep. naval power, you know, significantly. Yep. So that, that's a great point. Yeah. yeah. One thought on that one. Um, there's a lot of talk about sinking, uh, you know, one potential, you know, future secretary of defense was often quoted as the task is going to be to sink the Chinese Navy in the first, you know, 96 hours of conflict. Uh, that's a pyrrhic victory. Because all you're going to do is that we're, we're going to lose a lot of assets and a lot of munitions just to get to that point. The Chinese, as long as those shipyards are intact, they're going to be able to rebuild, come at us like, like Pyrrhic victory uh, in, you know, in Rome and Greece. And they'll just come at us again and they'll, they'll basically win the second go around. So this, their shipyards are also on that, that 96 hour list that need to be. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Well, Brent, uh, my guest today has been Brent Sadler, the author of the new Naval Institute press book, U.S. Naval Power in the 21st Century. To order your copy, go to usni.org forward slash press slash books, search for Sadler or search for the title U.S. Naval Power in the 21st Century. You will not regret it. It is a great book, a great addition to your bookshelf. Uh, share that with uh, with your friends and, and talk about it with uh all your fellow naval officers and uh, fellow Marines and Coast Guard, because it, it's just, it's another one that's got to be on everybody's bookshelf. So Brent, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for joining us at 2 a.m. to now almost 3 a.m. in, uh, in yeah. Singapore. Great talking to you. Uh, you. You have incredible stamina and uh, hope everything goes well at the Shangri-La Dialogue. Please do write up, you know, if, yeah. you, if you see some interesting things, we'd love to have a, a short piece for proceedings. We can publish it quickly uh, online. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, there'll, there'll be fireworks. I'll have something. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm sure. That's great. Okay. So our uh, this episode was brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Since 1873, our members have fostered the free and open debate that has moved the sea services forward. To become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. If you're already a member, invite a friend to join. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute. Mm -hmm.